breaking right now. So, <clears throat> so the, the picture back behind me that was taken at Bryce Canyon. Uh, and the uh, my wife and daughter and I were there this past summer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we basically had rented house with some friends in the very south of Utah. So we were about 90 minutes from the north rim of the canyon, about 90 minutes from Bryce Canyon, which we really loved. And then um, about 70 minutes from Zion National Park. And everything out there was just so wildly beautiful. It was, um, yeah. it was, it was great to be out there. It was just great to be out there. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's my wife and I anyway. The, um, but this morning also I'm coming. So I, I, I don't, I think it's been two years since I've been with you all. So, and, uh, um, you got muted, Gary. How did that happen? Here we go. Uh, Frank fat finger. Yeah, it could be. Um, I formerly left Eastern and, uh, right now I'm sitting in my office, uh, at uh, Chrysostom Academy, named for St. John Chrysostom. And we are starting in the fall. We're an Orthodox classical school and we are doing really well. Uh, I cannot believe how much we've been blessed by God. Very, very generous donors. Um, and so everything is just going very well. So anyway, I'm very happy to be back here. And uh, even if it is on Zoom, uh, which I have, like probably many of you come to love and hate at the same time. Uh, so, but Tim had said that you all are doing a book study um, that uh, was that we're looking at the Amish. And therefore, what I'm going to do for the two weeks that I have is basically talk about who, who are the Anabaptists and what is the Anabaptist tradition from which the Amish emerged, the Amish uh, the Hutterites, the Mennonites. So these are all very different than what we think of today as the Baptists, such as the Southern Baptist or the American Baptist. They are, um, they, they have some overlap, but ultimately they're very different groups. And so really the Anabaptist tradition is uh, a German tradition. Uh, really originating in Zurich and up the Rhineland. And it is with them that I'm going to be talking. Um, and so historically, almost any conversation now about the Anabaptists uh, begins with this. Um, uh, I don't know if it's gonna come in, come into focus. Uh, there we are. Um, it is a massive book by George Hunston Williams called The Radical Reformation. And it is 1,200 pages and very, you know, tight type. Uh, and Williams was just a brilliant, brilliant historian. He taught at uh, Harvard. Um, I think he split between Harvard University and Harvard Divinity School. He really just did an immense amount of work. And he, he called his book, The Radical Reformation. And by radical, what he meant was, uh, well, what, what we basically think of when we think of the word uh, radical in respect to its origin as a word, the Latin word radix means root. And for the radical reformers, which he divided up into several different groups, all of them basically had this idea of getting back to the root of primitive Christianity. And so there are several things about the Anabaptists and the radicals, as Williamson noted them, that there were um, kind of several overlapping ideas, which each of them had. But when he looked at them, and we'll look specifically at the Anabaptists in a moment, but he basically more or less broke them down into three groups. The Anabaptists were one group, 
The spiritualists were another group. And the spiritualists were largely dominated by what we could say was a very anti-traditionalist mentality. Now, there were ways in which the Anabaptists, we could say, were anti-traditionalists, but that's not how they thought of defining themselves, the Anabaptist group. And Anabaptist, the word Anabaptist just means re-baptizers. And the word was pejorative. It was given to them by the reformers coming out of Zurich because they sought to disregard infant baptism. All right. And so rebaptism becomes the norm. In other words, because everybody in that day and age, they had all been baptized as infants. They had all come out of the Catholic Church. And therefore, for the Anabaptists, the emphasis was on. Uh, what we would call the voluntary church, that the church had to be entered into willfully, consciously, uh, and therefore baptism was for adults. And upon a profession of faith. And so whereas today, modern Baptists, we think of the Southern Baptists, the American Baptists, or independent Baptists, they all practice a form of immersion. Whereas the original Anabaptists had no necessary idea about how baptism was to be administered. So the first Anabaptists who were in Zurich, um, they actually baptized, with, the first group was actually baptized in a man's home. And so baptism was not something that was seen as, as by immersion and dunking. So when we think about the Anabaptists, the um, There are a couple of things to keep in mind with them, and I'll go over this history a little more. But the second group after the Anabaptists are what he would call the spiritualists. And these individuals were actually almost revolutionaries. And, and, they're, and they're to be very much distinguished from the Anabaptists, such as we have come to know them in the Amish and the Mennonite. Um, and, and I will say this. I found this out some years ago. There are some 80 different Anabaptist groups in the state of Pennsylvania still. And so they're all different types of brethren, different types of Mennonites, um, and actually even different types of Amish. So they're in, in the state of Pennsylvania alone, there are some 80 brethren groups, things like this. So it's not a monolithic movement, but all of these groups, the brethren, the Mennonite, the Amish, all of them are very clear that they owe no allegiance to the state. And what is more, they are all explicitly pacifists, and, um, and not just pacifists in the sense that they're anti-war. Um, I mean, I am very anti-war, right? But I'm, I'm not a pacifist. I would use violence if I thought I had to defend my family, right? But for the Amish, the Mennonites, no, you, you don't even do that, right? So there is a very strong strain of nonviolence among the Amish, the Hutterites, the Mennonites, the Brethren. Um, my Greek teacher in college um, was a Brethren. And one night somebody came and, and just beat him up. And he just said, it was not my duty to defend myself. I had to turn the other cheek. So, um, so that's the Anabaptist. The spiritualists, on the other hand, in that tradition, these people were violent. And these people, um, beginning with individuals like a man named Karlstadt, who had actually been a colleague of Luther's, um, another group called the Zwickau Prophets, who basically had shown up in uh, Wittenberg, uh, after the deed of Worms and Luther's here I stand speech, 
Luther had gone into exile. I mean, basically his elector had kidnapped him for his own safekeeping. And while he was gone, these, the radicals showed up in Wittenberg. And uh, the Zwickau prophets basically said, we need no teachers. We are directly illumined by God. And this kind of almost millenarian apocalyptic notions about we're directly being you know, informed by God. And so these spiritualists, such as Karl Stott, such as the Zwickau prophets, another was a man named Thomas Munzer, these were the guys who were behind what was called the Peasants' Revolt of 1525, which saw tens of thousands of peasants um, basically die in this revolt against the landowners and the German lords. Uh, another group of the spiritualists who also basically claimed direct illumination uh, was a group in the town of Munster in Westphalia, which is now right up on the border of um, the Netherlands and Germany. And there, they established a kingdom waiting for the kingdom of God in this city. They expelled, um, the city basically had become divided between Catholics and Lutherans. And the Anabaptists more or less moved in and were able to drive out the leadership of both the Catholic and the Lutheran party in what in in Münster, and for several months, they set up a commune. Um, they basically said that no one could have um, any property, uh, and then it, it even came to the point where no one could even have no no man. All wives were supposed to be held in common, though it seemed to be that the leaders held more in common of the wives than everybody else. But um, eventually, I think it was in spring of 1536, uh, a joint Catholic Lutheran army stormed the city. And, um, and I will say this, that if you did not accede to the leader's uh, wishes, there were people, there were women who were beheaded. And so um, the city was stormed and the leaders were put to the sword. And uh, the followers were basically given the ultimatum, you repent or you'll be banished. And interestingly enough, the, um, and there are pictures of this, the one leader, uh, Ian Bokelson, his bones, his, his body was put into a cage after his execution and it was suspended from the cathedral tower and it was there till 1914 and I think it was the war that brought an end to the bones being there bleached in the sun um so so those were another group of the radicals right so yes Tim uh, question with with uh spiritualists being so violent and radical and uh the Amish and Anabaptists being so nonviolent, was that a reaction to each other or did they each develop that understanding and practice independent? It, it actually seems to be done independently um, because the original groups that we think of the Amish coming out of, they, they all came out of a group called the Swiss Brethren, uh, as they were called. And very early on, the Swiss Brethren were, were explicit about not being bound to any sort of oaths to the government and being nonviolent. And they were in correspondence with this fellow Thomas Munzer, who was the leader of the Peasants' Revolt, before the Peasants' Revolt. Like they were in correspondence with him and basically saying, you know, that we, we, we ought not follow these paths. Now, their uh, statement of faith is called the Schley Time Articles, were published in 1527. So this is after the Peasants' Revolt, but it was before everything that happens in Münster. And so I think that the, um, I don't think it was in response to either one. I think it was just a development that grew up and I mean, there is a great danger 
I mean, you all are students of history. There's a great danger to people who think that God talks to them directly, right? And, 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 and people who are possessed of their own sense of justice. And so therefore, you know, this is, and I, and I will say this, that after the whole debacle of Munster, there was a conscious attempt to uh, separate, um, particularly among the Swiss Brethren and Anabaptists, any sort of relationship with the radicals, the most radicals, the spiritualists. Um, and by and large, while we could say that some of the, um, of the Anabaptists had more charismatic leaders, not charismatic in the sense we think of today as the gift of tongues or things like that, but just people who seem to have um, a sense of direct calling, but not in the sense that, you know, I have this direct line to God, I know what you need, right? That really doesn't come. And so um, the, the last group that, that Williams talks about is what he calls the rationalists. And here there actually seems to be some link between the Anabaptists, but not overtly. But um, for the rationalists, that's, it's not the best word, but it, but it basically means individuals like uh, the humanist Erasmus. And I mean, these were people who were, I mean, Erasmus dies a Catholic, right? Uh, but it, it becomes extended then to individuals I might talk about a little next week um, who are anti-Trinitarians is really how best to think about it. And, but not only anti-Trinitarians, because almost all the anti-Trinitarians were individuals who in many ways would look to the temporal lords, their local counts, their local dukes. Um, but, and, and I think that this is an important thing, that among the rationalists, we see this in Erasmus, there grows up a, and, and this feeds into the Anabaptists, a skepticism of looking to any individual for somehow solitary wisdom and, and grows up skepticism and not skepticism in the sense that, you know, I don't believe in miracles or things like that, but skepticism in the sense that, you know, I'm really sure about this point, but am I necessarily doing the right thing in how I act on this point? And, you know, you know, as an illustration, I'm, I'm, I'm Orthodox. You guys are, you know, Presbyterians or you're attending a Presbyterian church. Therefore, you know, because I'm right and you're wrong, I should never associate with you guys. You guys are going to be in outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, right? Well, just because I think I'm right and you're wrong, that doesn't mean then that I get to act on that in such wild ways that cuts off any sort of discourse, right? And so this was Erasmus and especially a fellow named Castellio, who after uh, Geneva executed a guy named Servetus, Castellio basically you know, came out for freedom of conscience. And this is the big thing about the rationalists. They were strong for freedom of conscience. And they had a big influence in France, especially in discourse in France. And so ultimately, the radicals that were the rationalists, I mean, some of them were very much on the edge theologically. But they largely were looking for a way to think about how they were the first ones really thinking about we don't live in a monolithic theological world anymore. And among the reformers and among the Catholics, this was a really hard pill to swallow. And I mean, particularly for the Catholics who were very violent, 
But I mean, the, the Protestants could also be very violent. And so it was the rationalists who were saying, we don't live in a, in a monolithic world anymore. How therefore are we going to get along? And so this was the third group of Williamson's, but these were you know, largely what were termed uh, the radical reformation. So I'll just stop for questions because also I want to drink a coffee. Um, What was it about the Anabaptists that uh, created such animosity from, you know, German and Reformed and uh, Catholic communities? Right. So for the Anabaptists, or or let me ask you in this way, Gary, how much of it was their stance on baptism, which seemed to be implying the rest of the church was doing it wrong, and 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 how much of it was their unwillingness to pledge allegiance to the state. Yeah, so that that's a very good question. And in a sense, in a sense, they're, they're not uh, unrelated at all because, so really the Swiss brethren begin in Zurich. They begin about 1525. They're all very much in line with the chief reformer in Zurich, a man named Ulrich Zwingli. And uh, like Zwingli, they all have a background in um, humanism and the liberal arts, that is training in languages, training in rhetoric, things like this. And the, um, the leader of them, um, a man named Glauber, another man named Blaurock, basically uh, early on, there was an attempt to end the mass. And initially it was, you know, in the early 1520s, it was not done away. So, the, so even though Zurich had largely said, we'll follow the reformation, they had not gotten rid of the mass, uh, the Catholic Eucharistic uh, service. And this became a big point of contention between uh, Glauber, Blaurock, another guy, Felix Mines, um, but they were willing to go with uh, Zurich's ideas that we will keep it for now. But then in 1525, when it was done away, it became a far more pronounced thing. You know, when they actually came out and said, you guys are really not being obedient. The mass is idolatrous, right? Because it's bread worship, things like this. And so the Anabaptists, were people who, in a sense, the earliest Swiss brethren, were people who, for lack of a better way to put it, they were impatient for reform. Whereas Zwingli was kind of, also a bad way to put it, he was kind of a company man, all right? I mean, the city council did hire him as the chief minister at the great church, but he also was someone who basically was not saying, let's just throw stuff out because we think we need to throw stuff out. The baptism question came in 1525 and 26. And this is when uh, they're having a meeting in a house and they were actually banned from having meetings, but then they started having meetings anyway. And uh, one of the leaders, George Blaurock, basically said to this other guy, uh, uh, Glauber, I want you to baptize me again, right? In other words, I'm denying the efficacy of my baptism as an infant, that, there was, that that's not real baptism. And so he did, Blauber did, and Blaurock then baptized everybody else in the house, right, right there. And so one of the things that this was doing was, of course, it was saying um, that the baptism of infants was invalid. That's one thing. But it also was saying that in Zurich, the basis of your citizenship was that you were a baptized Christian. And therefore, what they were doing was saying was that citizenship in Zurich is not something you have as, as by both birth and the waters of baptism, but that it's something you enter into voluntarily. 
right? That the, the Republic of Zurich, the city-state of Zurich, doesn't exist as an entity in itself. It basically only can come into existence by act of political will. I mean, and, and this is actually a very radical thing. And in a sense, it's radical in the sense that they were saying, we, we deny our baptism. Therefore, we're basically saying the city of Zurich has no dominion or control over us because the basis of our membership in Zurich, we've actually renounced. And so the two of them are really tied together. And so, um, I mean, these people then end up, uh, some were banished, uh, a couple of them were executed and they were executed by drowning. Um, and so they were essentially um, cast out of Zurich, right? So, but they're the initial group. And in 1527, they meet in a place called uh, Schleitheim, um, S-C-H-L-E-I-E-T-E-I-M, I think is how it was spelled, Schleitheim, and drew up a very short confession of faith. And it's just called the Schley Time Articles, and uh, seven of them. And they, they, I mean, they were they were very straightforward, but the key ones were that baptism is for adults and by profession of faith. The denial of excommunication, in other words, that there is no overarching church that exercises discipline because this was the other thing in Zurich the church was kind of the moral watchdog of society and this becomes kind of a true thing in Geneva and in other places um, and it's interesting uh, I should note Presbyterianism actually exists as a kind of, um, so your board of presbyters, your board of elders, I don't know how many of you have ever been on the board or are on the board. Presbyterianism and the board of elders, technically the elders, as they were thought of, right? I mean, this was thought of as what should be going on in the church of France. Well, why? It's because in France, you couldn't count on the prince right? Because they're Catholics to implement morality. So therefore, it has to be the local board of elders who oversees the morality of the people, right? Well, anyway, so this meant there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a hand in glove relationship of the church and the republic, the church and the state overseeing morals. And of course, this meant that excommunication from the church meant excommunication from the state. And so therefore in the Shalai Time articles, it was explicit, uh, there is no excommunication. Now, well, what do they do about members who aren't living a Christian life? They, they practice what they call the ban. And it's what we come to think of as shunning, right? Well, we hear that term shunning. So, it's, it's not necessarily an ecclesiastical statement. It's really, I mean, we could say it's, you know, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. But in their mind, it wasn't a statement that affected who and what you were as a human being. It really was a statement about, are you a brother that I can sit and eat with, is how it was thought about. And then one of the other key things was oaths. Uh, the Amish, the Mennonite, the Brethren, they all resist oaths. They, um, in like in the state of Pennsylvania, if you are Amish, like there are things that you don't have to say when you go to give testimony in a court of law. In other words, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Well, the Amish, technically, if they're strict about it, they don't swear oaths. And therefore they won't. And therefore the judge will actually read something different to them. 
right? That's how it used to be. I don't know if it's still that way or not, right? But so this was all part of this in that they basically felt that they were first and foremost strangers and pilgrims anywhere they were going to be. And that they were explicitly anti-hierarchical and ultimately, um, so we see this in the Amish and we see this in the Hutterites. There is a strong emphasis on simplicity of life. And uh, this doesn't really carry over in the, among the modern Mennonites, I think maybe except as an affectation because most of the Mennonites I know actually live, I mean, you would never know who they were right, if you didn't know they were Mennonites. Um, um, the most notable thing I remember about Mennonites, because when I was in high school, man, that was a long time ago, but I still remember this. Uh, I, I went to a Christian high school, a fundamentalist high school, and we had a pretty good basketball team. And we played Lancaster Mennonite High School. And of course we were, you know, this was in the uh, 60s and 70s. So we were probably to find more, sadly, by our anti-communism, which means, you know, this emphasis on the Pledge of Allegiance and singing the national anthem at every game and things like this. Uh, and when the Mennonites came, right? Like I and my teammates, we're there with our toes on the boundary line and our hands over heart. We're standing up as straight as we could. The Mennonites were like, goofing off and almost mocking, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. And it was like really irritated us. It really irritated us too, because we couldn't beat them. They were really good. Anyway, um, but that was, right? So that that's kind of the Mennonites. But for the Amish and the Hutterites, right? So if you see the Amish today, and I drive through Lancaster now still a lot, I still see a lot of Amish. And the emphasis is on simplicity and on not being tied to things other than the gifts that God gives us directly. Um, this is why no dependence on electricity, you know, no things like that. Um, the Hutterites, on the other hand, I don't think the Hutterites are anti-modern to that degree, but they, the Hutterites are all very much communal. And the Hutterites almost went out of existence but in the 1700s, uh, there was a large migration from Germany, but particularly Russia, because they had basically a lot of them had emigrated to Russia, uh, to the United States. And now there are almost 50,000 Hutterites who live in um, like Idaho, Montana, and then into Alberta and Saskatchewan is where all their communities are. Um, very much community oriented, communal living, um, communal enterprises, things like this. So again, I'll stop questions. That almost sounds like uh, the Oneida community of uh, the mid 1850s with John Humphrey Noyes. Uh, they were pretty forward thinking. They had uh, ladies at that time that were shop foremen in uh, their different uh, uh, agricultural plants. And the only reason why I know this is I, I worked for Oneida at, at one time and wow. uh, actually got to stay in the mansion house on uh, part of the leg of our uh, honeymoon. Uh, but uh, one of my colleagues there decided that uh, on our honeymoon, uh, they would have a separate room for my wife and a separate room for me as a joke. But uh, they were pretty forward thinking. They're generally, generally, um, it was more among the spiritualists, oddly. Uh, and less so among the, um, what we would think of as, as a Swiss brethren. And uh, I, I don't want to speak for the Hutterites, but for the Amish. Um, I mean, there was still what we would think of today, right, as, as rather, um, for lack of a better term, traditional gender roles among them. But 
there, there weren't any real offices, all right? So th th there weren't presbyters. And so if we think about other groups that come out of this, like the Quakers, you know, there's, there's no uh, offices, but the Quakers are actually a very different group than the Anabaptists or the Mennonites. Um, they, they grow up out of England and they are, um, they have a lot in common. And so uh, there are kind of overlapping common sensibilities, we could say, but right. So yeah, so like the Oneida community, uh, there is an emphasis on community of property because you know you can look back at the at the book of acts and people look at these verses in different ways but clearly there were people who sold everything they had and gave it to the church and in, in a sense this is kind of the, the drive of monasticism as well right you give up everything you have you give it to the poor right this was saint anthony he gave everything to the poor other than the money that he set aside for his sister, who he basically shoved into a, a group of widows, right, into an early convent form, right? They went out into the desert, all right? So, but it, but it does go back. And, and this is something that I, um, I mean, I'm, I myself have, I don't want to say a love-hate relationship. I don't want to put in those terms. But all of us can simply think, you know, why do I need so much stuff? I don't need so much stuff. And, when, and whenever I say something like this to my wife, she goes, so you're getting rid of all your books. It's like, well, not that stuff, but, um, right? But I mean, it is, I mean, it's, um, there, there, there's something about living simplistically. It, 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 it frees our minds, right? It frees our minds from a lot of things. Anyway, other questions, because I know we're up at, at eight o'clock already, so. Barry, how did they uh, migrate and why to Pennsylvania specifically, 80 groups? Um, and are they exact de descendants from the Swiss group in 1527? Or did they spend a little more time getting up to Germany and then coming to Pennsylvania? Right. So, so largely they came to Pennsylvania because of William Penn. And Penn basically founded Pennsylvania as a religiously tolerant state colony and opened his doors to all these groups. So Penn was a Quaker and Penn looked at all these groups that had zero political standing in England at all. And, um, and he basically opened his doors to them and that's why they end up starting to emigrate. Um, this is why the Moravians came here. So the Moravians as a group, um, their, their distant origins are in Jan Hus, um, but eventually they come to be called what was called the Unitas Fratrum, the United Brethren. And they basically picked up a number of very Anabaptist uh, tendencies. Now, the Moravians themselves, uh, modern Moravians are, you know, I'm not even sure what modern Moravians are, even though I live in the Lehigh Valley where we have Moravian College, but there's no relationship between Moravian College and Moravianism. Um, but this is why they came here, but basically the places where they could go, where they could live in peace were very few. And there were largely really three places. Uh, Poland, and Poland this time was divided into two between greater and lesser Poland. Excuse me. And then Transylvania. And Transylvania, simply because um, its king was very influenced by the rationalists and the, and the Unitarian. They weren't called Unitarians at the time, but the anti-Trinitarians. And not influenced in the sense that I think that he agreed with them, but in the sense that he was going to say, you know, you can come here and live in peace. And basically anyone ended up going there and living in peace. And so Transylvania was part now of what we would think of as both Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Um, so these were the places where they ended up going. 
And of course, in Moravia itself, which we now also know is, is part of Czechoslovakia, um, there, that's where many of the Hutterites ended up for a long time. And so it was largely where could we go? And Poland, um, and then also what was the Northern Duchy of Prussia? And Prussia as a duchy, I mean, Prussia later becomes Germany, but the Northern parts of Prussia uh, had been Northern Poland and the King of Poland basically allowed it to become a duchy. And it was actually the first Duke of Prussia, the first Brandenburg Duke of Prussia had actually been the head of the Teutonic Knights, but he converts to Protestantism in 1525. And Sigismund, the King of Poland, recognized him as then a Duke. And basically he, what he called was he secularized all his lands, meaning all the lands that the Teutonic order held as monastic lands became the, that duchy. And so what they did was they actually practiced a form of toleration. And so these types of lands there in the Eastern part of Europe became havens for these groups. And that's how they ended up there um, because the, the Protestants especially were very much opposed to the Anabaptists. And the reason for this is they were seen as the extreme that everyone else was being brandished with. Now, I remember growing up, there was a, a Democrat congressman from Texas named Henry Gonzalez. And uh, so this was back in the 70s and 80s. And Gonzalez was kind of a fiery guy. He didn't like Reagan too much. Um, but he basically was kind of a 60s, 70s Democrat. And one, and I think it was a staffer of a Republican member of the House, called him a communist one day. And Gonzalez hauled off and punched the guy in the face. And it was kind of because Gonzalez was kind of a man of the left, but I'm no communist, right? And so this was the same thing. Catholics could look at uh, the reformers and say, see, this is what you guys are going to become. You're going to become these Anabaptists denying baptism and all these other things. And the reformers were like, oh, no, that, that's not where we're going. And so the reformers became, in, in many ways, incredibly hostile to the Anabaptists. Um, Calvin's first uh, issue of the Institutes in 1536 he wrote it and he dedicated it to Francis I, King of France. And it basically, the, an opening epistle is like, dear King, we're not Anabaptists. Please stop calling us Anabaptists. Because in his mind is everything that happened in Munster with the Anabaptist kingdom, right? And they're trying to run from that as fast as they can. Other questions? One question I have that I think we'll need to pass on the next week, if you're willing to handle it, then is uh, at least the way the Amish Grace uh, describes uh, the Amish in terms of uh, trusting in God and providence. That they they uh, don't question what's happening. They it's it's um, uh, not like the Book of Job where Job is wrestling with God. It's 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 acceptance even. Um, even though the, even though they don't understand it, so I'm sure there's a lot of historic stuff uh, that uh, is related to that. But again, uh, we only have a couple minutes, right? So yeah, I'm going to talk more specifically about the kind of the path of the Anabaptists next week. I thought this would be more introductory, um, and I mean, there's a, there's a lot of interplay between the, the several strands of the Radical Reformation. Uh, 
but you know the the dominant part of it are things um, such as we see in the Anabaptist tradition, which you know was very very much a minority report even in the Reformation, um, though. Uh, I, I would probably say that most of the people who were martyred during the Reformation were Anabaptists. I mean, there were different places where there were different martyrs in France and the Netherlands. Uh, certainly, we can think of in England, Fox's Book of Martyrs, things like this. But there, there were probably uh, thousands of Anabaptists who were executed or put to the sword. So, yes. But we'll talk about that next week. And, and basically, yeah, I mean, it, it seems almost like a um, a capitulation to fate, right? To put it like that. But no, we'll talk about that. But yes. Well, traditionally, we've asked the speaker to close us in prayer. So you want to entertain if there's any last lingering question or two speak now gentlemen if not we'll ask you to close next week all right oh lord jesus christ our god mark our steps before us this day watch over protect and keep us in all things bless O oh lord our families our friends and those in most need of thy mercy Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Oh, thank you. We look forward to next week. See you next week. Thank you much, Gary.